So hi everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Angela Webchick Byron, uh, and uh, I uh, am here to talk to you today about women in open source. Uh, so how this is going to go is I'm going to kind of talk and do my spiel for you know hopefully not too long. I'm trying to keep it to like 45 minutes or so. Have some time available at the end uh, for questions and stuff. And I'd especially like to hear from any women in the audience who have their own experiences they'd like to share because of course I'm just one person up here, um, and it's not very often that we get the mic, so it would be good to. Uh, so who the heck am I? I'm a woman, contrary to what my haircut might be. It's sad, you know, every time. Anyway. Um, I'm involved in open source. I'm involved in a, a project called Drupal. Uh, who here, has anyone here heard of Drupal before? <laughs> yeah, right on. All right. Um, so for anyone who hasn't heard of Drupal, it's, a, it's an open source uh, PHP framework thing for building websites. Here are some of the websites that are built on Drupal. Uh, Ubuntu's website, uh, This Week in Tech, Recovery.gov, uh, and The Onion, of course. You know, that's my favorite. Um, I'm kind of really involved. I'm a little what you might call obsessed with Drupal. Um, so I am the Drupal 7 maintainer, so I'm helping to produce the, uh, the new version, kind of leading development efforts on that. I co-authored a book. I work with Lullabot, who's a, an open source consulting company and education, primarily in the Drupal space. I'm on the board. Yeah, woo! Um, I'm on the board of the Drupal Association. I do development and design and you know general cat herding and documentation. Basically, <laughs> there's a way to help Drupal in some capacity. That's not translations because I'm dumb in that way. Um, then I'm there. So um, I'm also a huge geek. So uh, I uh, got my start with, you know, kind of obsession with computers back when I was a kid and I used to play video games. Uh, we had an Atari and, you know, Pong and all those great things and NES and on through the years. Um, we, we had a VIC-20, so I used to, you know, get those 321 contact magazines and you type out the 40,000 lines of code in the back and it would give you like a little box that moved like this. You know? Good times. <laughs> But I'm not, and this is important, I'm not able to speak on behalf of all women. So this talk is basically a combination of my own experiences and viewpoints, as well as what I've learned by talking to other women in the open source world. So why are we here? This topic is kind of silly, right? I mean, some people might actually say this topic is kind of sexist. You know, why are we drawing special attention to women? You know, we're all just people. Why do we need to? make a big deal out of, you know, the fact that there's women in open source. Um, here's a quote, which is relatively unknown. It says, hackerdom, hackerdom meaning, you know, people who are passionate about computers, not people who break into banks and steal credit cards. Um, hackerdom is still predominantly male, however, the percentage of women is clearly higher than low single-digit ranks, <clears throat> excuse me, typical to technical professions, and female hackers are generally respected and dealt with as equals. Does anybody you know who said this? Yeah. Is this something by ESR? It is by ESR. Very good. Uh, this is from the jargon file. Eric S. Raymond is uh, he's a co-founder of Open Source Institute. He wrote the Cathedral Bazaar, kind of a well-known sort of documenter of the open source world. How many people would agree with this? Yeah. Makes sense, right? You know, open source is it's all online. There's no race, color, gender sexual orientation, any of that kind of stuff. It's all about what you can do and what you can produce. It's very egalitarian, you know? So of course, you know, that's clearly what the deal is. So we're, we're, we're very logically minded people. Let's compare some numbers. So this is obligatory pie chart number one. <laughs> Here's the gender breakdown of male, you know, men and women in the uh, proprietary software industry. And these numbers come from a study called uh, Free Libra Open Source Software Policy Support, or FLOSS polls, um, which was a study conducted for the European Union back in 90, or I'm sorry, in 2006. So you can see that it's roughly a third, which is okay, you know. It's not great. I mean, it could definitely be a lot bigger than that, but you know, that's pretty good. It's respectable. But you know, that's proprietary software. You know, <laughs> cubicle monkeys, slaving away for paycheck. You know, but open source, open source is about freedom, right? You know, people all over the world coming together to work on a common goal, you know, crossing cultural boundaries and all this other stuff. 
So who wants to take a stab at what the participation rates are in open source? Less than 10%. Less than 10. 5%. 5. 5. It's 1.5. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> so before, before we get into that, why is this important for us to address? I mean, yeah, we would all love a happy, shiny world where women were created as, or treated equally as they were created, um, and we didn't have gender disparity and all this kind of stuff, but why is this important for open source people in particular? The first reason is because we all want open source software to achieve world domination, right? Of course we do. That's never going to happen if you don't bring the other 50% of the population on board with you, okay? Um, and it's also never going to happen if you don't have the diversity that women and other minority groups bring to your projects because you're going to keep thinking along the same line and you're never going to cross the boundaries that bring the adoption rates up to the point where they need to be. Because we all want to solve Ubuntu bug number one which is that Microsoft has the majority share of desktop operating systems and all that. On another fundamental uh, level, driving away women means driving away contributors, both women and men. And the men who are driven away by the kind of behavior that drives women away are generally the smart men, and you want more of them in your project. And this is exactly how much we can't afford to lose contributors. These are some statistics I pulled from the Drupal project a couple of weeks ago. So the big blue part of the pie chart 99.63%. Those are people who downloaded our software and then we never heard from them again. Right? How many of you use Firefox? And how many of you have filed a bug report for Firefox? That's pretty good. Awesome. <laughs> but, sample bias. Yeah, sample bias. Exactly. But, you know, I bet I, most of the people in here probably done Drupal patches too. <laughs> <laughs> that tiny, tiny, tiny little red sliver of pie. That's how many people, of all the people that ever downloaded Drupal, registered an account, okay? So we're talking not even a percent, one percent of people that they, they were so involved that they decided to register an account, you know, they got that far. And then you can't even see this number because it's so small. The yellow part is how many people did something with it. They posted a forum support request, or they answered somebody, or they fixed a documentation page, or they did whatever they do. Um, so we're talking about 0.5% at the very, or 0.05, sorry, at the very most generous level, because I had to do unholy things to even get, you know, a, a sliver of pie to show up here. But, okay. um, you don't want to lose contributors, and you least of all don't want to lose women contributors, because you kick ass. Woo! Woo! That's right! So here are some of the more well-known and not as well-known uh, open source contributors. Uh, who have to be women. Um, you have people like, you know, uh, Valerie uh, Aurora, she's a kernel, Linux kernel hacker. You have Leslie Hawthorne at Google, she's running a bunch of programs to help get new open source contributors involved. Um, you know, Mitchell Baker at the Mozilla Foundation. Um, one person I'd like to point out is, is Liza Kindred of the Drupal Project, who will be speaking <laughs> after lunch today on uh, open source business. Please check her out. All right, let's get back to this again. <laughs> so what are the reasons, what are some of the reasons we don't have more women in open source? So there's certainly social reasons, right? You know, stuff like women being discouraged from technology through their entire life. Um, you know, in childhood, our role models are like fairy princesses who get saved by the handsome, dashing prince. You know what I mean? Because we don't have a lot of like really positive, technically strong, you know, female role models. We have princesses in Disney cartoons. Um, you know, and then in popular media, whenever you see a woman at a computer, it's normally her being really frustrated that it doesn't work, or else it's her doing a secretary job. I mean, the, you never see, except in the movie Hackers, perhaps, uh, you know, a woman actually doing something useful with a computer, um, and you know, playing with it to figure out how it works. Women also have access to computers later in life. Uh, the disparity here is important because uh, there, there's two there's two figures here. There's there's a figure of when men versus women get access to computers for the first time, and there's also when they get access to their own computer. Because as we all know, you don't really get into things like Linux until you have your own computer and can destroy it, blow it up without like you know deleting your mom's like photo galleries and stuff like that. Uh, many women suffer from a lack of confidence. I'll be getting into this a bit later because I know it's very true for me. 
Um, and you're also entering in a male-dominated industry. You know, there's kind of this. You know, you're fighting against you know sort of preconceived notions about what girls can and can't do. It's sort of this locker room mentality that just kind of happens whenever you get too many of the same gender people in one place and you just tend to be kind of um, So a lot of people look at this and they're like, yeah. It really sucks, you know, but I mean, this is like global societal things. We can't do anything about this. I mean, not directly, right? So, you know, oh well, I guess this is a problem we can't really do anything about. But the thing about that thinking is these reasons apply to every single woman who's getting into IT generally, right? Uh, so those 28% that we saw in the proprietary software, they're dealing with all of this stuff too, and they're breaking that mold. So what are some open source specific reasons that we can actually do something? So the first thing that tends to cause problems is that anonymity can sort of create a safe haven for abuse. You get somebody behind a pseudonym and they start saying things that would get them fired or perhaps thrown in jail um, if they said it in real life. Um, open source can be kind of a competitive industry or, or you know, environment. A lot of times, you know, in order to drive something forward in an open source project, you have to sort of like get in people's faces and really rally for your cause and you know, argue it and be very assertive and that kind of stuff. Um, and loud, assertive women are generally called, you know, so we don't tend to play like that. Uh, there's also a common perception that it must be Einstein to contribute to open source. A lot of the open source developers that are high profile sort of get this god-like status sort of bestowed upon them. Um, and when people look upon that, it's sort of like, ooh, you know, I don't think I'm that good, so I'm going to, you know, kind of watch that and be interested in that, but not really. And then there's this. <laughs> because there are so few women in open source, whenever we do make an appearance, we tend to get gawked at, and we tend to and people make a big deal of it. And, and what it does is it, it just reminds us, oh yeah, right, I am in my minority here, I guess, yeah, this is great. Um, it makes us uncomfortable, and it, it makes us not feel like part of the team, and that's really what we all want to be. I thought this statistic was pretty telling. This is also from philosophy. Have you, ever dis have you ever observed discriminatory behavior against women in open source? You can see that almost exactly the same number of men and the same number of women, or sorry, almost the same number of women who said yes, men said no. So these people are observing exactly the same behavior and getting completely different interpretations of what's going on. So I'll give you one example. The first time I gave this talk, I was with one of the conference organizers and we were talking about whatever we were talking about. Um, and, and she's a big Linux geek, like, you know, compiling her own kernel every other day, and like way beyond what I can do and stuff. And this guy who had a, a computer couldn't connect to the Wi-Fi at the conference venue, so he came and asked me for help because I had a speaker badge, so, you know, I must know something. Um, so I was trying to help him, and of course he was on Windows, so of course he was having problems with the network. <laughs> and he turns to the girl next to me and says, yeah, we're dealing with computer stuff here. You know, and it's like, so, this is a perfect example where he didn't think he did anything wrong. He just assumed you, you're not speaking, so you obviously must be somebody's girlfriend. I mean, why else would you be a... <laughs> you know. But to her, it was like, what the hell? You know, you're just assuming that I don't know anything about you, and I can code circles around you, buddy. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example of that, where if men aren't aware of how their behavior affects women, we can lead to a big disparity like that. So some of the things that drive women away, are from open source of jokes. Ha ha ha. ha. Yeah. <laughs> but the general rule of thumb with this is if you can say this joke in a room full of women, including your mother, without one of them slapping you upside of the head and yelling at you, okay, tell the joke. If not, maybe keep it to yourself because maybe that's not going to be very welcoming for you. Um, then there's stuff like dates and marriage proposals. You, you help someone, they call them a you know, technical issue, and they'll say, wow, I want to marry you for that. And it's like, really? Would you say that to the fat bearded guy over there? Like, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you say that way. <laughs> There's also doubting women's intelligence and expertise. I see this happen a lot, too. You know, a, a new woman shows up on the mailing list and says, I think I encountered a bug, and gets a really detailed bug report and all this stuff. And they'll immediately assume that she's stupid and doesn't know what she's talking about and try to argue with her as to why she's wrong. It's like, why do you do that? Don't do that. You know, assume that she's right until it's proven otherwise or until she specifically asks for your help. Um, there's also this kind of crap, like, you know, 
Uh, I can't just be wrong. I must be having that time of a month because, you know, I can't do it. Just don't do this kind of stuff. But beyond this kind of basic kind of, you know, respect 101 kind of stuff, there's also some horror stories. How many people have heard about this? Yeah. Not that many. Okay, I'm glad I put this in here then. So this was a uh, this was a talk that was given at a Ruby conference like a month or two ago. Um, it says Couch TV perform like a porn star that spelled really you know clever. Um, the entire presentation and you can go find it online. Um, the entire presentation is all sexual innuendo with pictures of scantily clad girls. Um, and I think there's like two slides that also have scantily clad males and therefore it's not sexist. Um, the, the women and also the men who saw this spoke up about it, you know. Uh, they made blog posts and they're like, hey, that's really not cool, you know. Like, first of all, women are already a huge minority in the... Huge minority? Whatever. <laughs> 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 they're, yeah. uh, they're, you know, it, they're, they're really a minority compared to other open source projects in the Rails community. You know, there were, I think, 200 people at this conference, six of them were women. Why are, are you doing this kind of thing? Because it just drives women out. And the leaders of the Rails community, instead of listening to that and saying, wow, that's interesting, we never thought of it that way before, maybe we should, you know, make changes so that doesn't happen, instead went the completely wrong way and said, yeah, well, this is part of Rails edginess in our community, and if you don't like it, you should probably leave. Um, and that's, don't ever deal with a <laughs> accusation like that, because they lost one of their lead developers this way. Uh, he left the... Uh, the activism project that he worked on, because he uh, he said, I just fundamentally don't, I can't reconcile this behavior with, with what I'm seeing. And, you know, it got into all of this discussion about was it really porn, was it not porn? It wasn't about the imagery at all. What it was is, again, it's drawing specific attention to the fact that you're different, you know? Uh, if you're sitting in a room and, you know, there's three girls in the room and there's 200 guys, Nothing can possibly make you feel more like an outsider than this sort of inside joke going on between the presenter at the front of the room and all the guys in the audience. And so it made people feel uncomfortable. And the guy who did the presentation kind of issued an apology, which if you read between the lines was basically, yeah, I'm sorry that you're not more thick-skinned. Thick yeah. Don't deal with stuff like that. Um, there's also really horrible horror stories like death threats. How many people know of the, uh, the uh, Creating Compassionate Users blog? Have you guys heard of that? If you haven't heard of that, you might have seen this image or something like it. It's got around a lot. It's, it's the kick-ass threshold for uh, projects and how to, you know, how your goal is to vault users up. Kathy Sierra was one of the co-authors of this blog. Um, and really awesome information there on community building and, and, and this kind of stuff. And then around the time she was going to speak at ETEC in 2007, started this demensely deranged person who was doing stuff like posting Photoshop pictures of her head next to a noose and, you know, being suffocated by all this stuff and posting stuff like this, this, and, uh, you know, and it's not enough that it's just, like, mean, nasty stuff, but it's also, like, sexually charged mean, nasty stuff, of course. Um, and she actually canceled her speaking engagements. And the last time that she posted on that blog was April of 2007, which was days after this incident happened. So this is a woman who is making a huge impact in the tech community, being driven out of it by this kind of behavior, and it's not cool. So let's talk about more positive things. Okay. So those are the problems and the really bad problems that can happen. What can people do who are already involved in open source to help encourage them? The first thing is be sensitive to discrimination and moreover take action when it happens. You know, if if somebody's calling, you know, says some kind of a stupid comment, call them out on it, especially if you're a guy, by the way, because a lot of people who make these kind of comments won't listen if a woman says it's offensive, but they'll listen if a guy says, hey, cut that up. And if a woman sees guys and girls in the community saying, that isn't cool, it helps them feel like, okay, there's a couple bad apples in this community, but the, the majority of people are cool and I can I can fit in. But if they see that the reaction to someone saying something kind of screwed up is laughter or just ignoring it, um, it sends the opposite message. It sends the message that, okay, this is obviously acceptable behavior in this community and I don't need to be here. Ask women to participate. This like sounds really obvious, but it's like we spend so much time standing around like, how 
how can we possibly get more women to come to our local tech groups? Ask them. <laughs> Go find a friend of yours that you know is into whatever, or could potentially be into you know Ruby or PHP or whatever your later of the month is, um, and ask her to come along. You know, meet other people in the tech community. Um, you also want to fight the Einstein perception, you know, the whole thing like, I can't possibly do this because people are smarter than me. So I'm going to talk about this because this is very near and dear to my heart. I first installed Linux back in 95. It was Debian Rex, and it fit on seven floppy disks. <laughs> Many anyone remember that? Seven floppy disks? Not the 15 DVD, you know, assortment collection it is now or whatever it is. I don't even know if it comes on DVD anymore. I think you have to do the packaging and stuff. So 95. And I read everything I could about open source. I read a bunch of mailing list posts. I was, you know, big on like getting my family to convert over to Open Office and Firefox and things like this. Um, I was that annoying person in school who was like, "Well, if you're going to teach us ASP and, and Oracle, you better teach us PHP and MySQL too, because open source." Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> right? That was me. Very obnoxious. Still am. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, I kind of looked on this whole thing with wonder because I was like, wow, this is really cool. You know, these people are working, they're empowering everybody, they're creating this level playing field where anybody can get on this. You know, they, they can have a full featured operating system, they can have it for free. You know, and that was tremendously amazing. Um, so the way I viewed that is, well, those people are great and they're doing wonderful things, and maybe one day, one day in the grand future, when I have more development experience, and you know, I have 20 years in the field, maybe I can go and participate in that. If you actually participate in an open source project, that is the most hilarious viewpoint you've ever heard in your life. Because the people involved in open source don't know anything about what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, we just try our best. And everybody trying their best sort of makes it all work, you know? Um, but this was the thing, and, and it kept me out of open source for 10 years, because it wasn't until 2005, when I was just graduating school, um, that my instructor, who I'd been so obnoxious to, was like, hey, you like open source. You should try out for the Google Summer of Code program. Because it basically, Google's going to pay you over the summer to work on an open source project. And I was like, ooh. Well, they know we're students, so they can't you know, expect me to know everything yet. So maybe I'll try that and see what happens. And it changed my life. But it's frustrating, because if I had known that way back at the beginning, I could have you know, had 10 years of open source control. On the other hand, it works well for Drupal because I'm like making up for 10 years of long time now, so, you know. <laughs> so here are some tools of the trade when you're combating the Einstein perception. Um, one is make sure that within your community you're valuing all contributions and not just code. Yep. Woo! <laughs> this is really important. It's important because, first of all, all of those little bits and pieces from just reporting a bug report that makes sense, that's a hugely valuable contribution. Posting something more helpful than it's broke, fix it, you know. Just something as simple as that is huge. And all of these little pieces come together and make this thing work. Um, so that's the first reason we should do it. The second reason is that often stuff like fixing typos in documentation or answering another person's question, those things are often gateway drugs to people just going nuts and becoming like, you know, these key contributors in the project. Um, you should also create a list of low-hanging fruit tests. And this is not this is not to say that like, you know, women are stupid, so make something easier for them. What it is, is it's showing people, you know, there is this big, massive open source project here, but there's also like really, you know, kind of easy starter tasks that you can learn the basic tool set and you can get to know the community a little bit. Um, we have a, what's called the, the novice patch queue on Interval, um, which is a list of, all, the issue queue is huge. So we specifically tag a few things that are like, fix the white space here. <coughs> and you know, like add the period to the end of this sentence, specifically so that people who don't know how to do patches yet can figure it out. And, you know, it's, and the, the entire community knows that if someone comes into IRC and says, I'm working on a novice patch, <laughs> they've got like 15 people to help them through whatever they need help them. It's great. Um, fostering a friendly and encouraging environment. Again, this is just basic respect stuff. You know, make sure that, you know, don't be doing RTFM and stuff like that. It just drives people away. Take 30 seconds and point away. Because the thing about the, the, the newbie who asked the dumb question is that, you know, they think they, they might be now. They're new, you know. But if you encourage them and you help them along, they might turn into a rock star later. You have no idea. Um, make sure your how to contribute steps are well documented. This was something that participating in Summer Code will help. It's like you realize, oh, God, we don't help people out at all. We just kind of say, here's the issue queue. Have fun with that. 
Uh, it's good to like make sure that it's easy on ramps that are well documented for people who want to get involved. You can also explore things like mentorship programs. Uh, so, like in the Drupal project, we we have this thing called the Drupal Dojo, which is kind of stagnated a little bit lately, which is too bad. But what it basically is is like a, a structured peer tutoring mechanism where someone in the community just steps up and says, "I'm going to teach a lesson on something that I happen to know," and that can be something really easy, like here's how to configure a couple of settings and voila. Or it can be something very complicated, which is like, this is how this whole underlying system works. But the idea is that you're empowering individuals in your community to step up and take a leadership role. And you're also giving the, the new people in the community someone more approachable than like the rock star people to kind of ask their questions to and not feel stupid. Also, if you are a woman in open source, be out and be proud. Um, there's a website called geekspeaker.com, and you can register there with talks that you know about and are willing to speak on. And, Nice conferences like this one that want to get women speakers involved can go there and they can, you know, grab you for, for a talk. Um, this is really important because the more that we make ourselves known that we are out there and we're doing awesome things, the, the easier it is for, for other women to come along and say, okay, that's cool, I want to be part of that. Alright, so we talked a lot about problems and, you know, the situation that we're in and what men can do differently, but let's talk about the ladies now! Because that's what this talk is actually about. All right, so let's talk about how you guys can get involved. Uh, do we still want to? <laughs> God, you know, death threats, porn star, you know, do we really want to do this? The answer is yes. And I'm about to get mushy here, so, you know, if you're a sap, you might want to grab a So open source is fun. It's really fun. Uh, you know, you, you usually think of like sitting on the computer as being a very isolated thing, but it's not at all. Like, there's a huge community. You meet people from all over the world. You meet friends, um, especially at local events and stuff like that. Uh, these are two women in the Drupal community, Ali Mika, who's a Unix genius, and she runs her own hosting company, and uh, Karen Stevenson, who, so you guys all know what Drupal is. Do you know what CCK is? Content Construction Kit? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this module is like quintessential to building any Drupal site. It's basically your data model creator thingy. Um, where you know you map out your data model and it gives you forms and database tables and stuff for you automatically. So she's the co-maintainer of that. She's also the co-maintainer of the date module, which means she understands time zone code. My God, <laughs> I know. To that, no, that was a standing ovation. And what's interesting is about Karen is, is she's an accountant. She taught herself PHP because the guy who was maintaining her website flaked out on her. <laughs> she was like, this thing. She's like, oh, I gotta figure this out. Um, so, you know, it's just, you never know where people are going to come from and, and they're just going to rock yourself up. <clears throat> Open source is also very inspiring and educational. You get to work with people from all over the world that are just really, really smart. Um, and, and, but in addition to being smart, they're very like, open to helping you understand what they know. Open source is all about sharing knowledge. And so it's, it's possible to just ratchet up your knowledge about whatever it is that you specialize in very, very quickly about working with. It's fundamentally rewarding. This is something I personally believe. When you fix a bug, for example, or you fix a piece of documentation in an open source project, you're fixing that for every single person who uses that project. So if I fix something in Drupal, the United Nations benefits. That's really a powerful and amazing feeling. You know, you're really contributing to something bigger than yourself, as opposed to if you're in a proprietary software and you fix a bug and you get a new bug to fix. So get it. It's also an excellent career move. And this is particularly important given the economic climate that we find ourselves in. <laughs> um, because a lot of companies and a lot of governments are looking into how they can cut costs. And a big way they can cut costs is not paying $150,000 in licensing fees every month. So they're looking into open source solutions. And so people who are Drupal consultants and people who are Linux consultants and people who are you know, Postgres or MySQL consultants, they're either doing well for themselves now or they will be very, very shortly. And if women aren't specializing in these skills, they're going to actually be behind the curve. And I worry about that. So how do you get started on this whole open source train? Uh, you should find a project that interests you, like Drupal. Or start one of your own, that's important too. Uh, find out what resources are available to you in that community. So stuff like documentation, mailing lists, IRC. Uh, forums, working groups, blah, 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 blah. Find out how the community gets stuff done so that you can be best posed to, you know, be most effective in there. Uh, learn first. Evaluate the community. See if it's a good fit. 
Do people treat each other with respect? You know, do, are they working on interesting problems that sort of fits your philosophical beliefs? Um, if not, move on. Go to a different project. Or if you think you can change the system from within, I encourage you to do that. Um, but don't feel like you know if a project sucks, leave. You know, if you're one of 0.05 percent of people that are actually going to help an open source project, use your you know power to walk out if you don't like it. Uh, and don't tolerate BS. If somebody tries to you know be a complete asshat, um, you know you, you basically have three things you can do. The, the first one is object. You know, say hey, that's not cool. You know, and often like a kind of a private sort of you know, hey, when you said that, that really wasn't cool, and this is why, um, can, can be pretty effective, especially if it's kind of sarcastic. You know, sarcasm is often very, you know, it, it's able to communicate a lot more than, oh my god, you know. So, if they continue to do it, speak out, make a blog post, uh, put it take it to the public mailing list, see if peer pressure can help, you know, get the person to settle down. If it's still ongoing, you can you can take it, report it up to the, the top level, talk to the project lead, talk to the community manager, and stuff like that. Um, and again, ultimately, they decide they don't want to do uh, anything about the situation. You don't need to have anything to do with them. It's as simple as that. Um, I will say, though, to some extent, you, you probably want to pick and choose your battles. Um, there, there's situations where, you know, it can just be a complete time and energy sink to try and get this person to come around to your point. But a lot of times, where I'll, I'll spend that time and energy, so if I see somebody who I know isn't a mean person, but just says something kind of dumb, and educating them and saying, like, okay, when you say stuff like that, this is how it makes women feel, and this is why you shouldn't do it. And a lot of times that can help, because I see those same people that I talk to educating other men on how they uh, should approach things. You should also seek out other women in open source. Uh, Linux Chicks is probably the biggest, I think, uh, organization of, of sort of open source uh, women. There's also others uh, in that link there. Uh, contribute as early and often as possible. Again, the, the, the earliest that you establish yourself as part of that 0.05%, the better off you're going to be. Because um, people will be more likely to help you. Uh, you'll also have more clout behind your words because I'm um, like, yeah, I'm the person who rewrote the entire freaking handbook, okay? Listen to me when I tell you that that's not going to make sense. And finally, I wanted to close with some myth busters. So what is a contributor to open source? How many people, when they look, they think of, you know, someone like me, you know, hairy and crouched over a computer with lots of caffeinated beverages. And, <laughs> and there are definitely those people in open source. Um, but no, that's, that's not true at all. Um, a contributor is, is someone who has three traits. They see something and they say, that's dumb. They say, I want to do something about it. And they can do something about it. And something here could be anything. It doesn't have to be code. It could be, you know, again, the simplest filing a bug report and stuff. But those people in the middle there, those are the people that power open source. It's not the developers. It's not, you know, the marketing team. It's the people who just fit those two qualities. What qualifies as contribution? A lot of people think the only thing that qualifies as contribution is pages and pages and pages of code. No. What qualifies contributes is any of these things and more. So stuff like event coordination, stuff like you know marketing, documentation, um, issue queue farming is where you are on long, boring conference calls and you go through and you're like, hmm, I saw that bug before. That's a duplicate. Hmm, this one doesn't work anymore. I'm going to close it. Um, and just kind of help out you know people so that the, you know others can work on the development stuff and, and that kind of thing. There's also lots and lots and lots of coding if you're into that kind of thing, which you know. Um, and the final myth that I want to try and bust here is, is how improvements are made. So a lot of people think that the way open source works is you've got, you know, Gina the genius over here, right? And she's a genius, so like her head is like this big. <laughs> <laughs> so she's sitting there one day and, and you know, she's, she's reading the entire genius Bible for a little bit of light reading for afternoon tea. And she gets this wonderful idea and says, wow, that would really make things better. So I'm going to just sit here for a few minutes and code something, and it's going to come out, and it's going to be <laughs> glorious, you know. And everybody in the community is going to go, wow, that's amazing, and that's your best work yet, okay? How many people think that this is how open source works? <laughs> a lot of people do. It's hilarious if, if you're in open source, because you know this. So, you know, no. this is how improvements are actually made. So you got Edwina, the end user over here. 
<laughs> she's very angry because she just ran into a bug that prevents her from doing her work. So she's going to go over to the issue queue and she's going to post a bug report. Then you have Paula the programmer who's working off some other place, you know. And she also runs into the same bug. And she looks in the issue queue and she says, oh, hey, look, there's a bug report there. Well, I'm going to try and fix it. And so she posts patch or code in the issue queue. Then you've got Tatiana, the tester. She's got big goggle glasses because she needs to be able to carefully inspect everything. Um, she looks at that code and she says, what the? But then she says, OK, well, I'll post some feedback to try and help you out. So she posts a review. And then Paula says, oh, OK, thanks. Let's try take number two. And this goes back and forth for a while. Um, and then you're going to cross someone you know, like Wendy, the poor sucker stuck on uh, one of those people. <laughs> And she says, oh, it breaks in IE6. <laughs> <laughs> and the only reason she's on with is XP is because she's a, she's a book author. And so she also says, also, mind your spelling. <laughs> <laughs> so she posts a review that kind of gets those last little tweaks done, uh, you know. And Paula says, OK, how about try this one more time? And then Tatiana goes back to her and she goes, wow, that's much better than it was before. And Marcia has to ship it. So none of this stuff happens in the vacuum. There is never an instance where somebody just magically discovers this one piece of code and it goes in. This is a collaborative process that everybody contributes to. And they contribute what they know. Wendy isn't a programmer, but she has IE6. That's a valuable commodity in open source project because most of us don't. <laughs> And so honestly, if you have anything that you can, and, and you do, you have more than you know, you can get involved in an open source project and make a really valuable contribution. So in conclusion, women are massively underrepresented in open source, and that's bad. Um, but we can all take steps to change that, and that's good. And open source is awesome, and women can and to, should take it. The last thing I wanted to do was leave you guys with a bit of homework, you guys being male and female, I have to watch that. Um, you find folks in the audience um, invite a woman to your next local tech group. Uh, you know, find someone, and even if she's not into Ruby on Rails or any programming at all, if she has geeky tendencies, you know, she likes video games or something like that, bring her along. See if she likes it. Um, next time you encounter ass hat behavior, call the person out on it. You know, uh, revisit the documentation for your project slash community slash whatever that you do. Uh, make sure that it's easy for people who want to help you to help you. Uh, and finally, blog about a woman in your life who's inspired you. There was a, a recent movement called the Ada Lovelace Day, um, where a bunch of people blogged about women who are influential in their lives. And it's a really interesting read to go through all of those and see how many women there are out there making huge contributions both to open source and technology. And we need to recognize that. We need to draw more attention to it. And that's it for me. So we can open the floor to, to discussion and questions. I'd like to first say, though, are there any women in the audience who want to raise their hand and, and offer some of their own experiences or anecdotes or funny jokes or anything? Yes? I remember once a guy saying he wanted to start a women's SIG for his look. And for one thing, it's really not appropriate. A woman should start a women's SIG. But worse, he was an asshat. <laughs> to any woman. He ended up calling me Cert Girl because I have a certification or something. Oh dear. And it just So what would so the, her comment is that, you know, in, in her local Linux user group, uh, you know, someone wanted to start up a, a special interest group to help get more women involved. However, that person was a guy and the guy was also not very, you know, respectful. And those are a dangerous combination of, of people to be starting a, a special interest group for So what would be your recommendation then? Uh, uh, in my case, what I did was I wrote to uh, one of the leads privately and said, is it just me or, and he said, no, this guy's an asshole to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I mean, the rest of that list, they were used to him and they just told him to go blow himself. I mean, really... So that's good. So, <laughs> so in other words, you, you raised the concern. Yeah, you raised a concern and people validated you and said, yeah, that guy is an asshole, you know. Um, and then, you know, you saw people speaking out against him, so that probably, you know, was a good positive thing to see. If it had been different and you had seen them say, what are you talking about? That guy is awesome. You're obviously just overly sensitive and you should stop being such a girl. Probably would have had a little bit of a different uh, Anyone else? I know it's kind of 
putting you on the spot, and I don't like doing that, but we don't get the mic very often. So. Yes? Those were some baffling figures that you quoted earlier in your talk. Um, the, in particular, the percentage of people in open source that are ladies. I was pretty shocked by that because of how welp welcoming I've found open source and working in open source. And I, I wondered if you knew the, uh, the corresponding statistic in the Drupal community because I've got to say, like, way to go Drupal community. I have never, ever encountered or seen any discrimination. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, so she said she, she found the, the statistic about 1.5% baffling. Like, because that hasn't been your experience at all. And I agree, that wasn't my experience at all either. When I was first asked to give this talk, I was like, I'm just gonna make it about how to contribute to open source, because there's no problem here. And it wasn't until I actually did the research to back up my hypothesis that there wasn't a problem. I, I believe the Eric, Raymond, Eric S. Raymond quote, you know, before doing this talk, because my experience in the Drupal community is the same as yours. I never encountered that kind of thing. The, the closest I've ever encountered that is somebody said some sexist joke on IRC, and they were banned by the time I had a chance to read what they actually said. It was like, we do not tolerate you that. You've never been slashed out of heaven. I, I have been slashed out of it, not directly. So I have been directly slashed out of uh, for saying something, dare I say, negative about a Linux product. Uh, a writer, and uh, it probably would be very inappropriate for me to quote some of the things that were said. I, yeah, and, that, and that's the thing. I think Drupal is, so Drupal's percentage is somewhere around 8 to 12 percent, which, which is phenomenally better than the open source average, but it's, not, it's still not where we need to be. Um, and a lot of people have, have, you know, theories behind that. One theory is that web stuff, there's more women in web technology than there are in, like, kernel hacking generally. Um, also the fact that the way the Drupal community works with this whole peer review process really almost forces people to not be jerks because if you're a jerk, you're not going to get someone to review your patch, you know. And so people are almost guided in the direction. So the community sort of got processed and engineered around making people work well together. Um, it also helps that there are high profile women in the Drupal community who are, like Addison Berry is amazing. Like she's, you know, this coder and she leads the documentation team. She's touring all over the world right now doing you know, amazing things, and, and Karen, you know, the maintainer of CCK. Um, so, so men in the Drupal community have definitely learned, like, take women seriously, because those people rock, you know. But what I've found from reading around is that, I wouldn't say Drupal's like a bubble in this, you know, sort of like immune from all this stuff, because we do get jerks in the community sometimes. They just don't tend to last long. Um, but, but other women's experiences outside of the Drupal community is, is, is a mix, but there's definitely some much more negative uh, things that other women have experienced. So that's probably why the, the overall statistic is lower, even though in, there are certain projects, and I don't think Drupal's the only one by means, it's just the one I have the most experience with, um, that, that are uh, bucket the challenge. Yes? Oh! Well, can I address the Drupal Yes, because she has a story about Drupal that's not yeah, quite so rosy.
Well, and then she was operating like a crystal radio, which back in the day was like cutting edge of technology. So it was set in like the 1800s. And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. Anyway, I know. And this is not, I mean, that, that's a reason story. I, like I said, I've been in Drupal about three and a half years. It's totally, absolutely connected to Drupal. I think it's awesome that people don't experience it. But I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to sit here and listen to you talk about that's it. True. That's true. That's fair. Okay. But, but I will say, like, the, in this situation, and also the, the porn star thing, what, what it generally is, is it's somebody crossing a line. Um, and being told that isn't cool, and then be hit, you know, reacting to that instead of saying, whoa, you're right, sorry, I really didn't mean to do that, uh, instead of reacting, well, that's your problem for interpreting it that way, because uh, my intent was not that. So what often happens when, when something like this sort of kind of flashpoint thing happens to is it, it, it brings forth all of this latent feelings about the overarching sexism debate that takes place in, in society as a whole, the last ceilings and all this kind of stuff. And you know, gets the men really, really nasty and defensive, and gets the women really, really angry and like, no, don't you see? Um, and, and can create a bit of ugliness there. Um, so yeah, Drupal is not immune from this stuff. Um, though I, I did appreciate that the organizers, you know, were eventually <laughs> going to. Uh, it, the, the organizer was interesting because the, the, his first reaction was to shut up, and then over the course of the day, from people informing him what was going on. You know, Eliza, he and I jumped on the phone together and, and basically sort of sorted that over. Uh, and he said, yeah, I actually, I, I'm smarter than I was this morning, and I realized that this, this isn't Well, can I add one more thing to that, too? Yes. So, so what, what I feel like was the most important thing, uh, people launched this huge debate about was it sexist or not, what, what is sexism, it's not like, why don't you guys define what is art while you're at it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the point was not whether it was sexist or not. The point was, that I said, I don't think that's cool. But then everyone, like, not everyone, a lot of people decided that they didn't think it was cool that I had spoken up. And so what bothered me the most about the whole situation was not the design. The guys that designed it, they were educated and they changed it. It was the fact that all these people were like, how dare you accuse us of that? That's not what we're doing. And it was totally the reaction after the fact that it was a big problem. It's not a big deal if they did it. They didn't know any better. They fixed it. Yeah. But everyone else that came and like, attacked me for saying something. That to me was what the real yeah. Can you believe I spoke that? God, <laughs> you're gonna ruin internet communication while you're at it. <laughs> there was a question over here. Uh, yeah. at Hi. It, it kind of seems like you're drawing a conclusion that the reasons women are not in open source are some of the things you talked about today. But did you do some research to see if there's other reasons around? Yeah, that? I mean, there's other ones like too. issues maybe. And they basically go into like two different categories. They go into like larger overarching issues that affect women getting into technology as a whole, and they go into stuff we can actually do something about. Like not that we can't do something about getting more women in computer science and getting more, you know, encouraging women to get into technology earlier. But those are really big problems, um, and there's stuff that like you know I I look at that problem. And I don't know how to solve that. Don't you think there's something slightly different about open source, perhaps around how much, you know, certain family life issues and things yeah, like that. Yeah, there's a lot too with, yeah. Free time. We can't mm -hmm. hear anything she's saying. Yeah, so what she's saying is, she's saying the, the reasons that were said in the talk, are there other reasons that, that contribute to this? Um, and a big a big reason is, you know, women are often, because of social expectations and whatever, charged with things like, you know, raising the kids and, you know, doing the housework and stuff like that. They don't generally have the free time that men have available to them. I mean, man is done with work, is generally done with work, you know. Um, and this is generalizations and stuff like that, but um, to really get into an open source community and really become one of those rock star people, you do need to dedicate an awful lot of time. Um, and, you know, and, and women do dedicate time to volunteer efforts. A lot of times it's stuff like PTA meetings and, and things like that too. Um, so it's a matter of spreading what free time they do have available in, in the way that most benefits you know, their inner you know, calling or whatever they want to, to push. So yeah, there, there's things like that as well, um, and there, there's there's just an awful lot of, of complexity there. You know, there, there's things that. Uh, so what I try to do though is focus on things that we as community members in an open source project, we as project leaders, we as this can 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 fundamentally do something about. I can't do something about the fact that you know when when someone gets home from work they're exhausted and they just don't feel like sitting in front of a computer for four hours. But I can make it so that. Um, if that person has two hours available on the weekend, 
that there's a really straightforward, like, come here, read this three sentence, and you're good to go. Um, so I'd like to rather focus on those kind of things. But you're absolutely right that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of underlying social issues that, that contribute to this fact that, that you know, proprietary software has the advantage of it pays you, and it uh, you know, provides your family benefits and all this other kind of stuff that open source is never really going to need. Um, so, so there's a lot of, of things that we can't control, but the things that we can control will help not only women, but all women. Yes? Uh, I really love your presentation. I spent some time thinking about uh, how we can get, how we can, how we can treat community management as a core competency of open source. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really strikes me about your, your presentation is that the issues you raise around process and how we engage people don't just apply to women. Right. They apply to all coders. So uh, one of the things that I'm hoping that people who work and engage in open source communities take away from this is not that this is just a man or a woman problem, this is a community problem. Now, I'm not a coder, and I find it very, very hard to penetrate a lot of open source communities because there's a very strong insider outsider ethos, and in my contribution is often unclear, and, and people get and the reaction can be quite negative. And so the things that you're talking about aren't just about reaching out to women, they're reaching out to the, the millions of people who want to help but don't know how. Exactly. Yeah, so the, the underlying premise here is, is all of the stuff that helps women get involved in open source is also the same stuff that helps anybody get involved in open source. So there are positive things to make changes in your community anyway, um, because they'll just lead to, to raising that 0.05% um, you know, as a general rule. Yes, we out of time? No, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> talking about is not just about open source and it's not just about women it's also about community and in particular I'm involved with a politics oriented nonprofit that's going through a crisis of mem of membership and comp and direction and so on and these same issues of inclusion and welcoming and insiders versus outsiders are at work there so for example I'll bet that if somebody tries to start a pirate party in Vancouver they'll come across some of these same issues of how do we welcome people into the pirate party and how to make it grow so it's these are powerful and very general themes you're talking on. So his, his, his point was that the same type of things that apply to technology and open source apply to everything, including politics, because, you know, we want a pirate party here in Vancouver. Of course we do, you know. Um, and, but there, people are going to run into the same barriers, you know, how do I go from being an outsider to an insider and, and things like that, even, even in real life stuff. So, uh, cool. Yes? I have uh, two comments. Uh, the first, uh, relates to what you're talking about, and the second reflects on the opening keynote. Um, first of all, uh, Vancouver is home for another conference called the Vancouver Agile Conference, which uh, doesn't focus as much on technology, but more on process. And what I've found is that their keynote speakers, and in fact a large proportion of their speakers and mentors are women. And uh, it, it, uh, it's fascinating because many of them have been in the industry for a long time. And it's wonderful to go to a conference where people can talk about more than just the, you know, the latest thing and talk meaningfully about the real issues of technology and process. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to, to encapsulate, one of the key discussions that went on for a number of years was 
Our software developers uh, hierarchically male-dominated apes, <laughs> or are they playful and somewhat promiscuous? Playful chimpanzees, perhaps. Yes, somewhat, somewhat promiscuous bonobos, which oh. are, uh, you know. And uh, so this this dialogue went on, and on the uh, birthday of, um, uh, of famed, uh, I'm dropping her name, but she lived. Ada Lovelace. She lived with the apes. Oh, um, oh, yes. They were, they were saying how the, the bonobos, unlike the, the apes who beat down any opposition, uh, the bonobos make love to resolve their differences and celebrate their successes. And the men were going, that's great, you know, because they also had more than one partner. <laughs> until, uh, until our speaker, she pointed out that, well, they're, they're also bisexual. All of a sudden, the men just shut right down. <laughs> so, it was a, a lighthearted uh, approach. And, and uh, we need to think about process. It's much more important than technology. And on that light, our earlier speaker also pointed to quite a disparity. A very small proportion of people touting file sharing as a new political movement. I think you've well made the point that that movement might have an incredibly high proportion of men as opposed to women. And what do you think if this new movement gets more trade on the international scene? What impact will that have on our lives and the processes by which we live? Okay, so <laughs> to summarize, <laughs> um, uh, he started by comparing and contrasting this conference with another conference called the Agile Development Summit, um, which is generally more process-oriented than it is uh, uh, technology-oriented. So, uh, and there and there also happens to be more women speakers than males, you know, or proportionally wise more than here. Um, and that there's a lot of interesting discussions that take place there, including something about monkeys. So, um, and the second question was um, that. Uh, that file sharing is is uh, an issue being championed by a small number of people. Two minutes? Ooh, okay, I'll talk fast. Championed by a small number of people. Um, and uh, most of them are probably predominantly male. Although, I don't know if that's true. I know I'm passionate about that cause as well, and I, I'm, you know, last I checked. But, um, uh, and what impact that has on the larger overall, you know, if, if file sharing really is this huge tool in enabling, you know, the next generation of communications and stuff like that, what does it mean if women aren't on board with that? Um, I think it means the same thing it means when women aren't on board with open source. Open source is clearly the way that technology is heading, you know what I mean? Like, the, the, that's, the, it saves money, it's better quality, it's more secure, all this kind of stuff. It's only a matter of time before people get the message and start migrating en masse to open source solutions, at least in specific target areas, particularly government and, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, you know, so when women aren't on board with something that's like really taking off and, and about to become a, a huge economy, it's damaging, you know, it, it leaves us at a disadvantage. And I think it also leaves us at a disadvantage to not be aware of these sort of game-changing, uh, you know, sort of level playing field tools and technologies. So I think that, you know, if you're in the pirate party, apply these same concepts to bring more women into your cause as well. Because again, you know, like we, we need to, if we want the world to believe that file sharing is the new, you know, way that we communicate, um, and we want to change laws, and we want to, you know, raise the collective IQ of our entire society, you need women to do that, you know? And you should have women do it, because we're really, really good at stuff like that. Um, so, should we close her down? Okay, thank you very much.